Blessings, everyone. Greetings, and thank you for joining me on our Kelly Appeal TV, where we're going to discuss the topics of the appeal and where it's going. So everyone knows, um, if not, if you don't know, we had um, part one last Sunday, and today, Sunday, March the 6th, we're going to be reading part two of the motion filed by Attorney Von Jean on February 17th, 2022. And we're just going to break down in a 20 minute increment what they're saying um, in this motion and get your comments and ideas. So let's get right into it. Here we go. But where the government's evidence of an enterprise centers on its claim that the associated in fact members shared a common purpose of ensuring defendants illegal sexual activities. The government must offer some evidence that the members of the enterprise knew that their actions were promoting not just legal sexual activities but illegal sexual activities and the production of pornography. Put in terms expressed in Satinwood, the government was required to show that the individuals who made up the enterprise shared a common purpose to engage in a fraudulent course of conduct. To share a purpose requires the members to agree on what that purpose is. Defendant is not claiming that each member of the enterprise must have possessed knowledge about every predicate act that the defendant is alleged to have committed, but the government cannot prove a common purpose without showing that the members of the enterprise shared an understanding of what that purpose was which according to the government was promoting illegal sexual activity and producing pornography. Despite its bullying tactics, the government came up short on evidence that all of defendants' employees who made up this vague enterprise were working as a continuing unit to ensure defendant could engage, not just in sex, but illegal sex. No employee testified that he, she understood that their purpose in the enterprise was to recruit underage women nor did any member of the enterprise present any testimony that they had any knowledge about defendant's herpes diagnosis that he practiced unsafe sex or that he videotaped his sexual experiences. The government can point to no evidence that any employee possessed specific information about what precisely transpired in defendant's bedroom once he was alone with his female guests. Even if defendant's employees knew that defendant expected his guests to follow strict, even controlling, rules, and possessed recording devices like iPads and iPhones, it does not follow that the members of the enterprise shared a goal of promoting illegal sexual activity. C. Enterprise distinct from racketeering activities. To the extent the government argues that its evidence showed that the members of the enterprise shared a common purpose and had knowledge of promoting the defendant's illegal sexual conduct. The government has failed to demonstrate that the purpose of the enterprise was distinct from the racketeering activities. United States v. Smith, 413 F3D 1253, 1267. United States v. Keltner, 147 F3D 662, 668. D. Person Enterprise Rule. Separately, the government was required to demonstrate that defendant was distinct from the enterprise. It is axiomatic that Section 1962 clearly envisions that the person and the enterprise will be distinct. Bennett, 770 F2D at 315. This requirement focuses the section on the culpable party and recognizes that the enterprise itself is often a passive instrument or victim of the racketeering activity. ID. The United States Supreme Court has held that a RICO defendant must have participated in the conduct of the enterprise's affairs, not just his own affairs. Cedric Kushner Promotions, Limited v. King, 533 U.S. 158, 163. The government cannot plead its way around the distinctness requirement by simply alleging that the enterprise is defendant's inner circle and introduce a series of headshots of all of defendant's <coughs> former employees as evidence of an enterprise. The enterprise is alleged by the government existed because of its goal to promote the defendant in his legal and alleged illegal sexual activities, it had no function unrelated to the defendant. Under this factual pattern, the distinctness requirement was not satisfied. Because the government's RICO prosecution under this fact pattern is entirely unique, there is a dearth of factually analogous authority on this issue. That said, guidance offered in factually dissimilar cases leads to the clear conclusion that the government failed to prove an enterprise distinct from the defendant. Okay. The government failed to prove. That right there, that statement, is in fact a ruling towards Robert Sylvester Kelly's 
conviction that needs to be overturned immediately. They fail to prove. Let's keep going. That said, guidance offered in factually dissimilar cases leads to the clear conclusion that the government failed to prove an enterprise distinct from the defendant. In Riverwoods, Supra, the plaintiff Riverwoods Chappaqua Corporation claimed that through acts of extortion and mail fraud, the defendant Marine Midland Bank coerced Riverwoods to restructure loan agreements between Riverwoods and Westchester Federal Savings. Later acquired by Marine Midland, Riverwoods, 30F3D at 341. Riverwoods purchased a property in Newcastle, New York to develop residential condominiums and obtained a loan from Westchester Federal Savings Meta. For that purpose, ID, at 341-42, Marine Midland later acquired Westchester Federal Savings and inherit. Okay, so as not to get anyone confused, right now they are not talking about R. Kelly in this motion. They're comparing the case that is precedent to the RICO situation. So we're going to get right into, because um, this looks like a long motion. Okay, so let's go here and keep going. The Second Circuit reiterated that under the plain language of the statute, the RICO person must conduct the affairs of the RICO enterprise through a pattern of racketeering and that the person and the enterprise referred to must be distinct. ID, at 344, the court emphasized that a corporate entity may not be both the RICO person and the RICO enterprise, acknowledging that the distinctness requirement could be satisfied where there is partial overlap between the RICO person and the RICO enterprise, and that a defendant may be a RICO person and one of a number of members of the RICO enterprise. ID, citing However, by alleging a RICO enterprise that consists merely of a corporate defendant associated with its own employees or agents carrying on the regular affairs of the defendant, the distinctness requirement may not be circumvented. Hmm. ID. Finding that the Riverwoods had failed to prove the distinctness requirement, the Riverwoods court observed that because a corporation can only function through its employees and agents, any act of the corporation can be viewed as an act of such an enterprise. And the enterprise is in reality no more than the defendant itself. And the enterprise is in real and the enterprise is in reality no more than the defendant itself. ID. See also Brittingham versus Mobile Corp. 943 F2D 297 301, where employees of a corporation associate together to commit a pattern of predicate acts in the course of their employment and on behalf of the corporation. The employees in association with the corporation do not form an enterprise distinct from the corporation. ID. The Riverwoods court scoffed at the notion that the plaintiff seriously contended that the actions of the restructuring group were anything other than the activities of Marine Midland employees carrying out the business of that bank. Hmm. ID. The court reasoned, both the allegations in the complaint and the proof at trial showed that the individual members of the restructuring group were employed by Marine Midland at the relevant times. Those employees were acting within the scope of their authority as officers of Marine Midland, and all of the actions taken by the restructuring group, such as negotiating and executing the restructured loan and exacting personal guarantees from Shapiro, were undertaken on behalf of Marine Midland and were directly related to the bank's business. ID, at 345. The Second Circuit reached a similar conclusion in Discon, Inc. v. 9X Corp., 93F3D1055. Their Discon, Inc., was a New York corporation whose primary business was to provide removal services to telephone companies. ID, at 1057, Discon argued that the defendant 9X, a holding company that controlled subsidiaries Miko and Nitel, conspired with AT&T Technologies to eliminate Discon from the market removal services by defrauding the public. ID, at 1058. Discon sued the 9X defendants for civil RICO, alleging that the 9X group which consisted of 9X, Miko, and Nidel were three separate corporate persons that conducted the affairs of the 9X group, Enterprise, through a number of illegal predicate acts. ID, at 1063, the Second Circuit observed that the distinctiveness requirement could not be circumvented by alleging a RICO enterprise that consists merely of a corporate defendant associated with its own employees or agents carrying on the regular affairs of the defendant. ID, relying on Riverwoods, the Second Circuit stated that, here employees of a corporation associate together to commit a pattern of predicate acts in the course of their employment and on behalf of the corporation, the employees in associated with the corporation do not form an enterprise distinct from the corporation. ID, 
The court observed that like the defendants in Riverwoods, 9X, Miko and Nitel operated within a unified corporate structure, and even though they were legally separate entities, the relationship between 9X, Miko, and Nitel was not substantially different from that between the loan officers in Riverwoods in comparison to the bank. ID. At 1064. In both cases, the individual defendants were acting within the scope of a single corporate structure, guided by a single corporate consciousness. ID. See also, Atkinson v. Anadarko Bank and Trust Company, 808 F2D 438, 440-41. Applying the rules of the foregoing cases, the government failed to prove an enterprise distinct from the defendant. By alleging a RICO enterprise that consists of defendant and his own employees' agents carrying on his affairs, namely promoting his brand, his music, and his sexual needs, the government fails to satisfy the distinctness requirement. Hmm. Put differently, because the government alleged that defendant's employees associated together for no purpose other than to carry out defendant's needs, including his illegal sexual activity, the employees did not form an enterprise distinct from defendant. Defendant and the alleged enterprise were one and the same. E. The government fails engaged in, or the activities of which affect, interstate or foreign commerce, to conduct or participate, directly or indirectly, in the conduct of such enterprise's affairs through a pattern of racketeering activity. This provision anchors the Act to Article 1 Congressional Power by incorporating an Affecting Interstate Commerce requirement. The United States Supreme Court has determined that an enterprise is engaged in commerce when it is directly engaged in the production, distribution, or acquisition of goods or services in interstate commerce. United States v. Robertson, 514 U.S. 669, 672. However, consistent with the Liberal Construction Clause of the RICO Act, some courts have held that the racketeering activity of the enterprise need only have a de minimum effect on interstate commerce. This court instructed this jury consistent with the view that the government need only prove that beyond a reasonable doubt that the enterprise had a minimal effect on interstate commerce. This court further instructed the jury that it is not necessary for the government to prove that the individual racketeering acts themselves affected interstate or foreign commerce. Rather, it is the enterprise and its activities considered in their entirety that must be shown to have had that effect. No source was provided for this specific statement of law. No Assuming source. the government was only required to prove that the enterprise had a de minimis effect on interstate commerce, the government failed to establish that element by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Because the existence of the enterprise in this case hinges on the specific activity of promoting defendants' illegal sexual activity, the government was required to prove that those racketeering acts affected interstate commerce. Courts have held that to satisfy RICO, only the enterprise, and not the predicate acts themselves, must affect interstate commerce, however, that is only where there are nexus between the objective of the enterprise and the charged racketeering activities. While the government may, and did, argue that defendants' activities centered around promoting and performing his music-affected interstate commerce, the charged racketeering acts are untethered to those activities. The government cannot end-run the affecting commerce requirement by claiming an economic purpose of the enterprise that has no connection to the charged racketeering activities. The government's ability to prove an enterprise turns on its claim that the purpose of the enterprise was to promote defendants' illegal sexual activities and create pornography. Thus, the government does have to prove that those activities affected interstate commerce. Defendants' alleged conduct of engaging in sexual activities with young women under the age of 18, exposing adult women to herpes, and or videotaping his sexual activities with individuals under the age of 18 cannot be said to have any impact on interstate commerce. And so did you hear that? They were throwing in old information to create a bias against him so the jury would automatically find him guilty, although they indirectly distracted the jury from staying focused on the actual clause that was being presented the actual fact in question, and that was interstate commerce that had nothing, nothing at all to do with the prior understanding of what the judge instructed the jury to understand. So he distracted him on purpose, and it sounds like it was on purpose, but let's keep going.
Indeed, the de minimis effect approach here amounts to an unconstitutional extension of Congress's commerce power and is contrary to RICO's distinctly economic legislative history. It is beyond debate that the legislative history and the congressional findings accompanying the act reflect Congress's prevailing concern with the negative economic impacts of criminal infiltration into legitimate businesses. Some scholars have argued that eradicating criminal infiltration of legitimate business activities was the act's only purpose. Hmm. Gerald E. Lynch, RICO, The Crime of Being a Criminal, 87 colum. L. Rev. 661, 666, N. 22. Admittedly, the Supreme Court in Turkey sanctioned the application of RICO to non-infiltration when it held that a RICO enterprise may be a wholly illegitimate organization. Scholars have observed that Turkey marked an expansion in RICO prosecutions. D'Angelo, Frank, note, turf wars, street gangs and the outer limits of RICOs, affecting commerce, requirement, 76 Fordham L. Rev. 2075, 2084. D'Angelo writes, the first wave of expansion extended RICO in the areas of government and corporate corruption. During the 1980s, federal prosecutors used RICO to prosecute corrupt corporate officers, state officials, and judges. A second wave saw prosecutors use RICO to prosecute violent gangs. Until the late 1980s, murder was rarely prosecuted in federal court, but since then federal prosecutors have used RICO to bring down murderous motorcycle gangs, white supremacist groups, and ethnic street gangs. ID. As D'Angelo points out, in most of these types of cases, RICO's commerce requirement was easily satisfied. ID. In all of those scenarios, an economic motive was driving the racketeering activities. In contrast, here the alleged enterprise in this case had the objective of ensuring that defendants' sexual desires were satisfied. There was no economic motive driving these activities. F. The government's proof did not establish a pattern of racketeering. The government must also demonstrate a pattern of racketeering activity by proving, at a minimum, two predicate racketeering acts that occurred within 10 years of one another. C-18 U.S.C. Section 1961 Proof of two predicate acts is not sufficient to satisfy its burden of proof. The government must also show that the racketeering acts are related to each other and to the enterprise and together pose a threat of continuing criminal activity. Huh. H.J. Inc. v. N.W. Bell Telephone Company, 492 U.S. 229, 239. See also, Reich v. Lopez, 858 F3D 55, 59. Predicate acts must bear a relationship to each other that manifest the continuity required to prove a pattern. United States v. Pitsonia, 577 F3D 455, 465. RICO is. This court observed in Reich that the Supreme Court has instructed courts to interpret the pattern element the same way in civil and criminal cases. Reich, 858 F3D at 61, N.4 inapplicable to perpetrators of isolated or sporadic criminal acts criminal conduct only forms a pattern if it embraces criminal acts that are related in delicato 865 f2d at 1383 and this is where i think that they got the documentary together dream hampton got the documentaries together and plugged them in as a testimonial evidence regarding to how they were going to pull the RICO act together with multiple um, with multiple criminal acts. And that's how I think they even misinterpreted that part of it. So, wow. <laughs> wow, this is a good thing for Robert. This is great. Forms a pattern if it embraces criminal acts that are related. In Delicato, 865 F2D at 1383. Focusing on the relatedness requirement, the predicate crimes must be related both to each other and to the enterprise as a whole. Reich, 858 F3D at 60-61. See also United States v. Dadone, 471 F3D 371, 376. Dot. Horizontal relatedness can be shown through predicate acts that have the same or similar purpose, results, participants, victims, or methods of commission, or otherwise are interrelated by distinguishing characteristics and are not isolated events. Huh. H.J. Inc., 492 U.S. at 240. See also, Indelicato, 865 F2D at 1382. 
Where the enterprise in question is not primarily in the business of racketeering activity, predicate acts must be related to each other in kind for a RICO case to proceed. Reich, 858 F3D at 60-61. Vertical relatedness requires only that the defendant was enabled to commit the offense solely because of his position in the enterprise of his involvement in or control over the enterprise's affairs or because the offense related to the activities of the enterprise. Okay, now let's stop there. How is he controlling anything if all he is doing is making music? He has a whole entire entourage handling his business, um, handling his bank accounts handling the secretary is making um, connections and public relation teams are doing their part. So how does he have time to horizontally create this manifesto of chaos in his life? How is he able to do that? But anyway, let's keep going. Vertical relatedness requires only that the defendant was enabled to commit the offense solely because of his position in the enterprise of his involvement in or control over the enterprise's affairs or because the offense related to the activities of the enterprise. United States versus Burden, 600 F3D 204, 216. With regard to the continuity requirement, the government must present evidence regarding the timing and temporal scope of the alleged racketeering acts to demonstrate either close or open-ended continuity. Timing. Timing. When you're talking about 30 years, an incremental time frame, and then Andrea Kelly saying specifically in her quote, there's no time on my healing, that just, oh my God. Are you following me? Please tell me that I'm being followed and I'm not crazy here. Thank you. With regard to the continuity requirement, the government must present evidence regarding the timing and temporal scope of the alleged racketeering acts to demonstrate either close or open-ended continuity. Reich, 858 F3D at 60. Criminal activity that occurred over a long period of time in the past has close-ended continuity, regardless of whether it may extend not the future. Close-ended continuity is primarily a temporal concept that requires that the predicate crimes extend over a substantial period of time. ID. In contrast, criminal activity that by its nature projects into the future with a threat of repetition possesses open-ended continuity and that can be established in several ways. Some crimes may be by their very nature a future threat. ID. When the business of an enterprise is primarily unlawful, the continuity of the enterprise itself projects criminal activity into the future. Similarly, criminal activity is continuous when the predicate acts were the regular way of operating that business, even if the business itself is a primarily lawful. ID. The government failed to demonstrate a pattern of racketeering activity because it offered insufficient evidence of most of the predicate acts and the charged acts lacked sufficient relatedness and continuity. Awesome. <clears throat> so we're going to stop there. We're on page 27. And the reason I want to stop there is because we're going to go over racketeering act one bribery. So we need to keep these concepts separate. So we'll understand what's being said in the motion and, and totally understand this. So what are your points from what you've heard and how <clears throat> the overstepping of justice, um, the overstepping of, of <laughs> justice was not served in the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly. Goodness, everybody was just doing what they wanted to do. Everybody was just trying to plug it. And this is what it looks like when you have corruption putting together a formula to bring someone down. Not saying that R. Kelly is 100% squeaky clean. I'm not saying that. He's a man. He's had sex. He, you know, could buy sex. He could do whatever. He could do some immoral things. But is immoral things justifiable in the court of law to file forms of, of convictions on, such as racketeering and bribery and you know, Man Act and RICO Act. I mean, this is ridiculous. And if we don't keep a tap in on this type of activity within the justice system, anyone can be taken advantage of in this way.
Okay, so let's meditate on what we've heard. This is part two. I'm going to finish it up because we only have about 30 more pages. Okay, we only have 30 more pages of the motion to review. But right now, I want to have you really meditate on what you've heard and see if there's anything that tweaks your understanding, something that you can throw out there that, you know, shows that this was an injustice act upon the federal government against Robert Sylvester Kelly in this um, this conviction. So I thank you so much for liking, joining, subscribing, and commenting on this podcast. And we will see you next Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the remainder of the motion. And then we're going to just have the motion put into a playlist on our channel. So you'll go to the playlist and you'll look at the different um, options you have there. And this will be titled Motion Filed um, for Appeal 2022. That's what it'll be something like that. So we do have um, on that playlist a section of um, R. Kelly Appeal TV. It will definitely be there. But then it'll be also on the motion filing review. And then we have Solar Coaster, the biography of Robert Sylvester Kelly. So please go over there and um, just listen to some of the podcasts and give your points of view. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next.